So I'm here with Serja Popovic from Serbia. Now, this is a little bizarre. We're on a train from Newark, New Jersey to New York City. I just met you at a Rutgers University lecture that you were giving on how to create a revolution and how to turn over a dictatorship. I, you know, I, I don't normally go to university lectures and I don't normally sit on a train with a revolutionary. And you fundamentally were going through some very simple points. Could you cover that first? Well, I normally sit with revolutionaries because that's what my group does. We meet with revolutionaries <laughs> around the world. And fortunately, we, we give the good lectures on the university. I was presenting my new book called Blueprint for Revolution on Rutgers and basically talking about the main topics, which is how common people can become the agents of change. And we were looking at the things which are useful in any case, like, you know, how do you build the unity, how you mobilize the people, how you talk about the small victories and things that really matter to the people as opposed to the big world, big talk and all, work and all. And also, how do you make this interesting from the people who are always sitting in a fence and never ready to join? Part of the, of the story was a story of me and my crazy life as a Serbian revolutionary turning to be politician, turning to be revolutionary consultant. But most of it was talking to the predominantly black students about the things which can be changed here in the United States. And this is where you jumped in with your great questions on, you know, how we teach people that the foreign military intervention doesn't work. Well, you know, part of the story of the book is that nonviolent struggle works far more better than the violent struggle and it is our joint cause to persuade the people across the world, first of all decision makers, that the non-violent struggle is the tool to change the world as opposed to bombing. I know that I was on the bombed side of the, of the work in 1999 when the United States bombed my country, so I am easily persuaded. Well, that's the next part I want to get to. You were how old in 1999? I was uh, 27 in 1999. Okay, so take us back. What made you get involved? In, in your country. Tell the story about what was going on very briefly in Serbia and what made you do the call of action. Well, it was, a, I was kind of the rock kid at the point and I wasn't really care about, I thought the activism is for boring old ladies who fight the dog's rights. But basically because Milosevic, the crazy guy who was ruling my country's 90s, was drugging my country in war and war crimes and destroying the system of values, it was kind of necessity to really join this movement. And throughout the eight years, we learned the A, that occupying square and singing in our little blurb is not enough. B, that you need to get to the rural people and less educated people. It's not that the people like really clever university professors or people with smart glasses like you are on our side and rock musicians. We need to get to the rednecks in places like, you know, rural places to mobilize them. And then we were looking at, you know, how to build this unity, how to force opposition to stand behind one presidential candidate, how to force international community to understand that pushing is not the solution. Because what you happen when you bomb the country, and that happened in my case, the local uh, support for the local dictator boosts. I mean, this is the phenomenon of the bear in the cave. You know, it's like you have a people in the cave, but when the bear is in front of the cave, people immediately get together, kill gator, they, they get rid of bear. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. That's <laughs> what train says, yes. <laughs> but at least we get some more time for the, for the interview. So, yes, bombing things is not the solution. It only brings people more around the center of the circle. Remember George W. Bush. His ratings were highest day after 9-11. Obviously, people were gathering around the leadership when the system is attacked from the outside. So bombing countries is not the solution to changing the world. What was it that just, I mean, what was that turning point for you? Well, it's difficult. There was not a single one turning point. We have seen our worlds disappearing. We have seen the crazy let me, guy... Let me restate mm. the question. You didn't know what you were doing when you got into it, right? Of course I didn't. Now you're looking back and you're analyzing what were the effective pressure points, the leverages. But prior to that, you're 26, 25 years old. What was going on? Well, it's like the, the, it was listening to the people around you and understanding that your world is falling apart. It was also a uh, destruction of this cosmopolitan culture in which we grow and turn it into something very xenophobic 
and fear of other nations like Croats are our opponents. So it's, it's crazy. I grew up taught to love Croats and then I ended up being given a gun to go and kill a person because it's different nationality. And it's also the very bad service the, the Milosevic paid to Serbia and I think that's a lecture for a lot of Americans. Getting in war abroad uh, uh, may sound like a very good idea for you know national bulls, but it also brings a very bad name. Very soon, you know, we are still witnessing the people who, who when meet you, they think about the Bosnians, Srebrenica and ethnic cleansing, you know. As a Serb, you have problems around the world. You're still paying this crazy price. You're talking about the United States. I'm talking about everywhere. Right. I'm talking about the Europe. United States, I travel a lot and I meet the people from around the globe. What most Americans don't realize that this was uh, under uh, 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 President Clinton. And President Clinton was the first president to use a, a sort of a preemptive strategy outside of the United States when we were not threatened. How does that how does that come from a Serb? Can you take us through that history course? I think that was I mean, first of all my, my personal impression was that of course Milosevic was doing terrible things and that was not only Bosnia, it was Croatia and Kosovo and elsewhere. And I think the decision was basically initiated by Tony Blair and Clinton was kind of more leading from behind, something like Obama was doing in Libya. But in both cases, I think what they didn't calculate is that the violent struggle doesn't bring a social change. You can stop some of these troops from doing ethnic cleansing, you can destroy a few tanks, but what did happen to my country was, you know, it's like 4.5 thousand people dead, the large portions of inf infrastructure destroyed. A civilian goals, you know, being hit by the military. And at the end of the war, Milosevic was stronger. He was not weaker. It took indigenous nonviolent movement, which is the great movie called Bringing Down the Dictator You Should Watch, tells a story about to bring down this guy down. And this is the grand lesson here. The only way to get rid of the bad guys is from the inside, and you need to support the people who want to do so this. So do you believe inside. that Britain and the United States were actually going in there for humanitarian purposes? No, I think it was, well, it's very difficult to say that was what they quote, but it was completely legal. There was no confirmation from the Security Council of the United Nations. So in the, from the point of international law, it was the clear violation of international were, law. Were any of the diplomats trying to work with groups like you in order to try to figure out what Serbians thought could have worked outside of military intervention? It's very difficult to say. I don't think, I mean, the diplomats were there and we started our movement 992, 96, 98, the Otpor, the real movement which ended up with Milosevic was started. But I think it was such a huge international pressure and such a powerful propaganda machine, which was basically given one word, you know, if, if the only tool you have in your toolbox is a hammer, meaning airplanes and bombs, then every problem looks like the nail. So nobody was listening about the fact that this problem is not a nail. It's a little bit more complicated than the nail. And you know, I think the, the West jumped into bombing Serbia without really understanding how long it will last or what effects they will produce. They somehow naively think that it is enough to fly a few planes and then you know, immediately Milosevic will go out of his box. What they didn't realize is the bad guys are using the foreign pressure to boost their popularity at home. And that was the game Milosevic was playing. Wow. So I think that's very important because what you're now doing for Americans is you're establishing some outline of how this might be happening today with what we've been doing in the Middle East for many years. And we're back in there. Now, the questions that you were trying to fester out of the students is, what are you going to do with the revolution? You, you had a slide that said, it's about you. You're the one that has to make the change. We have the issues with police brutality, the militarization of police as an outsider looking in. How do you help Americans? Just give it, break it down in baby steps. What could they do to help make a change in, in their communities? Well, it's very difficult to advise groups as a foreigner. And in fact, you never tell them what to do because you never know, they know better. But if you look at a set of tools Americans need to organize the popular movements, it's there. You had a very successful anti-war movement in the 60s and 70s. This is the country which gave birth to Martin Luther King. This is the, I mean, I would advise them to start watching Harvey Milk, the movie. So there is so much, well done things here and a lot of these case studies are in, in my little book and I mean baby steps would be first of all dream big start small offer the vision of the future and start with small little tangible victories 
a step two learn to listen if you want to numbers to join you there must be something for these people to joining you you want to go and listen to what black people want you want to listen to what the police want and you want to try to build a platform where kind of everybody can agree upon it sounds like a crazy story but it happened in many other cases uh, step number three build a strategy and tactics it's not only about the demonstrations and yelling and jumping on the street there's so many different things you can do you know from small acts of resistance little tactics of dispersion and you know it's like doing petitions drafting on the new laws using building from the fact that you have democracy so there is a lot of the political space and uh, step number five be lightheaded don't take it too seriously humor sometimes work and creativity is powerful you had a lot of creative people you're the nation who loves to laugh so you know use this loftivism and a sense of humor and last understand that the first revolution happened in your head so it is you who need to understand that you know you're a little hobbit ready to take ring to the mordor and nobody else is going to do it if you don't change it yourself what question do you love to be asked uh who you would not be what you are what you do mm -hmm. the answer is i would be teaching and fishing in colorado <laughs> we can make that happen for you let's okay. make this happen we, we could create that revolution for you and your family well you're going to be out in colorado we're going to show you introduce you to a bunch of people and some of the people who are going to be watching this are going to want to hear and come and talk to you thank you very much thank you very much